Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 114, Extra Life 2020. The games we played, what went on, and how we did overall. Live from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. New York Toronto time at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, so this past weekend, uh, the weekend of November 7th, was Extra Life 2020. And today we've got a special episode dedicated to that worldwide gaming charity fundraiser. We're going to be talking about how things changed due to COVID-19 this year, what we ended up doing for Extra Life this year, and how much we raised. Then we're going to go over all the games we played and share our thoughts on each of them once we get to the Bellhops Tabletop segment. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week we take uh, a look back. Whoa, take a look back. Where am I? I said Bellhop's <laughs> Tabletop and I don't even know where I went. Each week we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Like I don't think I've ever messed up this part. This has been the same since I think episode one. And except we switched who said it. No, we didn't even switch that. Yeah, no, we did. Anyway. It used to be, you used to say we love interacting yeah. with our listener viewers. And I'd always, when I took over, I'd, I'd keep reading the you whole thing. You kept going, yes. So anyway, each week we're going to highlight interactions with people. We'll share feedback we receive, comments on our content and gaming discussions we've been part of out on the web and online. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as tabletop bellhop one word. And I can be found as dark elf LX. Just two quick comments today. First, Todd Foley had this to say about our The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel review. Thank you. I'm very curious about this type of game. Well, thanks for the comment, Todd. Uh, this was over on MeWe, and I wanted to bring it up because we went on to describe, uh, talk about the Coded Chronicles system and how it worked. And Todd was fascinated by this new system for doing escape room and puzzle style games. Now, my strong recommendation to Todd, and this stands for everyone, in my opinion, is to check out Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion first. See if you dig the system or not. As I stated in the Shining review, I don't think the Shining is a great introduction to the system. I think Scooby is a much better suited to that. And then speaking of Scooby-Doo, what I want to mention, too, is I've been seeing quite a few people commenting, especially there's a big Amazon sale going on and Scooby-Doo is part of the buy two, get one free deal. And I've seen a few people commenting on me sharing it, that people are thinking it's a kid's game. They're like, well, I don't want to pick this up. It's just a kid's game. Or I'm going to pick this up for my kids to play Christmas morning. And I'm this is a little disappointing because this is very much to me, not a kid's game. While you can play it with kids, I just can't see a group of kids sitting down to play on their own. Like that's just not the kind of, it's more of a family a family game night kind of thing, or a group of adults who are fans of Scooby-Doo or have memories of Scooby-Doo or remember the Mystery Inc. team from when they were kids. I don't think this one's for kids at all. To be honest, I'm not sure what it says in the box. I'm going to guess like 12 plus probably because uh, there is a ton of reading and the puzzles are not easy. Like that, they're not overly difficult, but I just... I'm just picturing my two girls are going to get, they're going to get bored for one of reading for, for, to each other. Plus there's some of those puzzles. I don't think they ever would have got. Uh, I believe it's eight plus. Uh, eight? I'm just pulling okay. that up right, right now. Uh, if it decides to actually work for me, I know BGG was having problems. No problem. Oh, no. But like uh, community says eight plus. So the box says 12 plus. See, I, exactly. The I think 12, 12 plus, plus is probably closer. Um, well, at least someone who's 12 plus, right. you could play with someone who's eight, but I think you need that adult or older kid there to guide things, to direct things, right? Like, I, I think kids can play it, but like, I just don't, and I just, kids game. It doesn't, it's not a kid's, it's, plus the fact you can only play it once. Like, if your kids read something wrong or read the wrong entry or do the wrong thing or rip something, you know, the game's done and you're not going to be able to play it a second time. It's not like the one of those, this will keep the kids busy for a few hours kind of games. Well, and It's I definitely think more of an experience. Unfortunately, I think they're tough. They're they're in a tough spot because really, I think family game is their their key market. 
right? Yes. It's something parents play with the kids. Uh, because adult Scooby-Doo tends to be more of the the druggy right right it, there's well, a lot yeah. of the, the pot references the scooby snacks and and there's a whole lot of of the 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 drug sort of jokes and 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 mm -hmm. uh to re references that are made just for the adults to get that the kids won't get uh and i think rightfully they've kind of stepped away from that and they've avoided that yeah. to keep it very family friendly, right? You don't want to mm -hmm. be playing that family game and your kids are suddenly saying, why is everyone, you know, suddenly getting all hungry for Scooby snacks after they got <laughs> smoked out of the room? Uh, you know, that, you know, you don't mm -hmm. want that to have that discussion in a game. And so they've avoided for that, but in doing so, some of the adult crowd has, has skipped out of it. Yeah. Yeah, overall, uh, and then The Shining definitely not for kids. Like that, that, that is very much not a kids game. Absolutely, uh, that that's an eighteen plus game. At I don't know, maybe sixteen plus or eh, thirteen if you're really into horror movies. But that, yeah, that that's stretching that's a stretch. it. Um, up next, a comment from Richie Miles about that Amazon sale you just mentioned and the landing page you and Deanna have been working on <laughs> all week. Love it when you put these sales on my radar. Just picked up $90 worth of RPG books for $60, then bought some kinetic sand and other random stuff that happened to be lumped in under the sale. Thanks. Well, thanks so much for the comment, Richie. Um, I love getting feedback like this. Like, we can always tell when there's one of these sales how popular it is by uh, pure numbers, right? Like, I can look up our page views, and I can look up our clicks, and I can see on Amazon how much stuff's been bought and so on. But it's great to get a comment like this showing that people actually appreciate the work. It humanizes a bit, which is cool. Now, regarding the sales, the road to Black Friday has already been paved by a number of offers like that started a week ago. It's crazy. Like this week, it's a huge buy two, get one free sale at Amazon. And I'm sure there's going to be something just as big next week as we continue deeper into November. What I do want to point out though, is if you're at all interested in keeping up with tabletop gaming sales, just be sure to check out the blog. We've got a couple things for one, the latest sale is probably going to be pinned to the top of the page like this one. We do have menus at the top leading to other different sale pages. And also I strongly recommend you follow tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. Well, you can also search for the group Good Geek Deals on Facebook if you don't use Twitter or search for Tabletop Gaming Deals on MeWe. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. Before we get to our main topic, we have just a few quick announcements. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll send out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, new videos, etc. As long as YouTube's actually working when I'm trying to create the newsletter, which was the problem today. It should go out tomorrow. Well, you can sign up by going to TabletopBellhop.com and subscribing right there in the sidebar. Or go over to Newsletter.TabletopBellhop.com. All right, we still have a giveaway going. And right now you have seven days, one week left to enter our Animal Empire giveaway. Head over to tabletopbellhop.com and look for the pin post near the top, probably under whatever this week's pre-Black Friday sale is. <laughs> Yeah, as of right now, we actually have a really low number of entries. I get it. It's a previous review copy. It's a game people haven't heard of. But you know what? This one's worth checking out, especially if you've got a big group. If you can get up to eight people together and you enjoy negotiation diplomacy style games you should check this one out i at this point we've got under 200 entries so your odds of winning are pretty dang good all right well good luck all right november is always the busiest time of year for deanna and i and this year it's been busier than ever with companies all trying to get the jump on each other, we've already had two like massive sales hit. Like I said, the buy one, get one free sale on Amazon right now is insane. Right in the middle of these two big sales was Extra Life, where we were up for over 24 hours. To say we've been busy would be an understatement. Plus, it's unlikely that things will let up anytime soon. Yeah. Actually, Brack Friday uh, week is only two weeks away at this point. Yeah, so due to this, I am sorry to announce that we're going to be taking a short break from podcasting and doing live shows. Don't worry, we're not pod fading. We have full intentions to come back once some of this ridiculousness dies down. 
Yeah, you can expect to find us right here, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop on Wednesday, December 2nd, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York, Toronto time. We'll be back. I just need some time off I'm trying to fit this in and then the show notes and editing the show notes and getting everything out on YouTube and promoting it while trying to take care of this other stuff that actually honestly pays the bills has been a little difficult. Well, we will see you in three weeks. We love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right, so one of the things I do have tonight is I do have something to open that is really cool looking. I don't know how well I'll be able to show it off before the unboxing because I don't know how it's packaged, but it's one of the most beautiful games I've ever seen. And it's one I was excited about a long time ago when it came out and they have an expansion coming out and I've got both the expansion and the game to take a look at tonight. I just don't know how well I'll be able to show it off because I do want to do an official unboxing video. So depending on how things are packaged, you may or may not get to see the cool stuff that's in this game. Uh, and then in the chat, um, Deanna is predicting that the sale next week will be an Asmodee um, map map amnesty sale. So what that means is Asmodee, with Asmodee, which owns Fantasy Flight and Plaid Hat Games and a bunch of other companies. Actually, they just let Plaid Hat go, but they own a lot of the Plaid Hat licenses still. Um, they own the old Mayfair Games. They're the people who own Catan now. Are going normally have a deal where you are not allowed to advertise their games at more than twenty percent off. That's the the minimum advertised price policy is what map stands for m-a-p-p so what they are going to do is they are going to break that for a week they'll allow people to sell and advertise sales that are bigger than that now for one that'll be a huge sale on asmodee.com you'll be able to go at asmodee and, and be able to buy cheap games but also all the other online retailers will generally jump in on this as well so that's probably the big sale that's going on for those of you listening at home right now that's her prediction um we got a whole bunch of stuff on here. Uh, Deanna pointed out, don't need people. The Shining is not for kids. I don't know. Based on some of our kids' friends' favorite TV shows, I would not be surprised <laughs> if some kids wanted to pick up The Shinings. I suppose, yeah. I mean, I, my daughter loves um, It. So, you know. she's There you uh... <laughs> go. She's a little older, though. She's in that 12 range, right? Yeah, yeah. The 12 yeah. plus range. Yeah, so that's why I said, in, like, like the right that 13 minimum. year old. Yeah, yeah. That right 13 year old, I think, I think could could be okay with it. But like we they have like going back two years ago, their friends were watching Stranger Things and we're like, I don't think you're gonna like Stranger Things. <laughs> My kids hate gore or anything scary. Um, one of them is now dedicated to only watching cartoons because too many real things have scared her where cartoons right. don't. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my son isn't big on horror, my daughter trending that way so yeah see I, it was never anything i was really into and it, no i still haven't seen the shining we talked about renting it so the other big discussion in chat tonight is what we should call our fans this has come up a few times hoppers boppers bellies bellies is kind of funny <laughs> dingers i don't know dinger sounds weird bellions bell hoppers bell hops bell hops makes sense except yeah, I, if i'm the tabletop bell hop more bell hops i guess sounds weird yeah i mean Technically, I would be the other bellhop since I'm actually sort of employed. I, I, you know, we're we're the bellhops. I don't know. I, that that's uh, the staff would be know. the bellhops, and 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 guests is really the one. Well, that guests think... is the best, but it just sounds we'd like to welcome all our guests. Yeah, like it just it's not that great. Like guests is the better VIPs, right? Like our, yeah. our VIP guests. But like you know, it, it doesn't match up with something like say critters. Like you know, if you're talking on YouTube yes. about the fans of something, if you say critters, everyone knows what you mean. If you say guests, it's a little more ambiguous. Yeah. Everyone's like, "Yeah, what are you talking about?" <laughs> the bell ringers. Um, I like that actually. <laughs> <laughs> then everyone starts Quasi playing oh. as Quasimodo. Um, I, I had both that one. Alrighty. Um, let's put so all the mountain have... pop. Mountain yeah, Papa, Mountain yeah. Papa was asking if the if the sales are .com or .ca. In general, .com, Canada, Black Friday, like enough companies do it, but board game wise usually stinks. So we will check .ca, and unless they do something special this year, it's probably going to be mostly .com. And to be honest, most of our audience is American, so surprisingly enough, and it's yeah. one of those cater to the audience. I. I we may, I don't know. I don't know if we'll do it. We'll probably do at least a basic Canadian landing page for Black Friday, but I'm not certain. It's one of those for the amount of time we spend. It's just not worth it in yeah. Canada, unfortunately, despite being Canadian. 
I uh, I need to I need to I think I need to replace my Kindle, my silly little eight eight inch Kindle uh, tablet. Um, I went to read last night when I wasn't sleeping, and it won't power on. Ooh, that's not it good. just all of a sudden decided to brick itself. Um, but I mean, they're on on Black Friday; those are usually dirt cheap. So I yeah, it, it may have been do. the perfect time for it to die on me. True enough. Um, dingers, the dingers. I, there's probably a reason we shouldn't. I feel like that's a term. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I haven't run across it. Nothing, nothing leaps out at me, but it just feels like that's one of those cringy terms that we might want to be careful of, but who knows? All right. So tonight's topic is the worldwide extra life charity gaming marathon. And what I'd love to hear from the chat today is if anyone in there, any of our guests took part in the event this year. And if they did, how they took part, because today this year was definitely exceptional, and how much they raised. If you haven't taken part this year, I'd love to hear some past stories about extra life successes. What I'm really curious about, though, is what people did due to being stuck at home compared to like, we, we came up with something, but it was pretty last minute. And I would love to hear what other people did to uh, be able to game and raise some money. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We've mentioned it before. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word on pretty much every platform out there. Now, the best way, though, is for questions to come through the website. That way they get logged in my email and they actually go two different places, so there's little chance I'll miss them. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we're going to take a short break for answering your questions to discuss Extra Life, a worldwide charity gaming event that happened this past weekend on November 7th. All right. So first off, for people who don't know what Extra Life is, because I realize it's it's still kind of niche, even though it's getting bigger every year. How about you give us an overview on exactly what Extra Life is all about? Sure. Well, Extra Life started as a fundraiser in 2008 to honor a young girl from Texas who had a particular type of cancer. And it went, they got together and started supporting pediatric cancer research. It was organized by the owners of Sarcastic Gamer and focused on video gamers doing a charity marathon, marathon and earning don donations by hours they played. So people would, uh, you know, say, hey, for every hour you play, I'll give you a buck. Or, or at the, I believe in the initial year, the average was $3 per hour of gaming. Now, that continued on, but then in the third year, the organization expanded to become worldwide and support specifically the Children's Miracle Network of 170 mm -hmm. children's hospitals, well beyond the original narrow focus of just pediatric cancer. Now, in the fourth year of their existence, they hit their first million dollar <laughs> year. And since that event, they have grown enormously with major support and sponsorships coming from Twitch and Wizards of the Coast, as well as Humble Bundle and many others. It's expanded to things like Tabletop Day and hackathons, encompassing mm -hmm. so much more than just playing video games for 24 hours on one day of the year. In those 12 years, they have raised more than $70 million for member children's hospitals with over 100,000 players now taking part year round on every continent outside of Antarctica. And best of all, because of the way it is organized as a part of the Children's Miracle Networks, every penny donated goes to the hospitals. There is no percentage that goes to the organizers or any sort of extra life management. Yeah, the way they make their money is when you sign up to raise money, you have the option of becoming a premium member. And what that'll do, for one, it unlocks some bonuses. Like you can see behind me, I've got some medals. I had to unlock those and T-shirts like this one. But that's the money that pays the people behind it is the, I think it's 19 something US to become a premium member. And at that time, you can actually give additional money to it. But other than that, the money that the participants raise 100% goes to the charity. Now, Sean did mention this is a video game event. That is how it started. 
But I don't know when tabletop started getting involved. For us locally, it was actually nine years ago when a local gamer actually got involved. So um, our, my friend Jamie actually got involved in it. And this is when I first learned about it. Is he got a hold of us on my Windsor Gaming Resource Pro Boards forum, because this was nine years ago, <laughs> and said, hey, I'm going to be gaming for 24 hours. How about you meet me at the local game store, Hugan and Munin, and be part of that day and play some games. And we did it. We all went down there. We met up with Jamie for about six hours, who had already been up for something like eight and played a bunch of games with his kids before coming out. And it was a great time. And then we sat down and went, you know what, why will, why don't we all do this next year, right? Why don't we make this a bigger thing? So starting from then, we made it a Windsor-wide event. And this year would have been our eighth year taking part of it, part in Extra Life. And it has gotten to be almost like Windsor's local game con. Like it's, it's, it's a big deal that gets lots of people involved. And every year it's gotten bigger since that first night when we gamed with Jamie at the local game store. More people take part, more games are being played, more stuff in our auctions and more money being raised. Eventually it actually spread to become a multi-day event in the last few years. First taking up pretty much the entire weekend of Extra Life, usually going from Friday until Sunday, mainly so people could get in their 24 hours of gaming whenever they wanted. And so people could split it up into two 12-hour shifts. Plus, we wanted to have events at multiple venues. So there are multiple game stores in Windsor and other places that wanted to take part. So we wanted people to be able to go to the place they support or visit all the places. We started having multiple events. Start taking part in, Sean mentioned that there's a tabletop appreciation day. So we'd take it, we'd have a game day on that, or we'd have warm up events. We'd just try to get the buzz out and try to let people know about it. Or we had like a RPG specific event where all we did was get a bunch of GMs to run games. Just a ton of stuff going on, almost starting like as early as March, leading up to the event in November. Now, last year was the first time I became actively involved, uh, coming down, managing the tech side of things for both uh, our sort of uh, initial test event, which was uh, mm -hmm. for the stream, which was the Tabletop Appreciation yep. Day, uh, and then going on to that full 20, however many hours stream <laughs> on uh, on the actual day, uh, learning how to, uh, you know, run a stream, sleep in the van, and and keep running the stream, as well as uh, helping to run the option, auction and playing a bunch of different games and raising funds. I think we average about 36 hours on, on the, the, the events. Cause we usually start at 10 AM on Saturday and go until 6 PM on Sunday. And that's not counting breakdown and everything else. And set up yeah, yeah, the set up the breakdown, getting in the night before to make sure everything's you know ready. And, and then there's the auction set up. Yeah. <laughs> the auction is something else to be honest. Thank, thank so you. Thank we, you very much to D every year. Uh, yes. And I'm sure she, appreciated a, a little bit of a break once not having to you know spend weeks yes. and weeks uh prepping, prepping for that auction yeah. so we've actually talked about how to raise money for charities by gaming it was back on our episode i don't have the number but it was called gaming for a good cause was the podcast number you should be able to find that on your podcatcher we'll be sure to drop a link in the show notes we have a bunch of things we normally do on a gate on game day so uh, we'd accept cash donations, obviously, um, as well as online donations, right? Anyone who was a team member could join, anyone who was playing could join our team and then raise money on their own. We sold baked goods, uh, especially in the last couple of years, thanks to Ron Bala of the Coffee Exchange for donating those, as well as other people who have over the years. Uh, we sold coffee. We've had at, at midnight, there was a tradition of a midnight pizza where we would get pizza brought in at midnight and sell slices of it to get people to do it and then the biggest one of the biggest money makers we had were cheat jars where what we did is we put out a jar on every table and people would donate money to cheat re-roll dice draw extra cards take extra turns whatever that was always huge and then we recruited local gamers to run tournaments and we'd have an x-wing tournament or a war machine tournament or even last year we had dave garby come down from kitchen to run a gaslands tournament with that were the auctions we mentioned already, and those are, were literally our biggest money makers. We would have live and silent auctions, and then just uh, giveaways and swag and things going on for people taking part who were present at the events. And another big part of that were sponsorships. Every year previous, we've reached out to game publishers, uh, game companies, game designers, local game stores, local, just local shops that were willing to look, offer up support, tool and die shops that donated money. We basically got a bunch of sponsors that provided all kinds of things, whether that's donations or games to play, games to put in the, actual, uh, the auction, things to raffle off, prizes for participants, and so on. 
uh, in addition year, to this, last year we even had uh, other, uh, you know, we had a major uh, digital component uh, for the second year in a row. We had the uh, the team come down and set up. Uh, I'm blanking on the name now. Artemis. The Artemis uh, squad yep. set up their their uh, thing in one corner, so you could actually uh, pay a, a few dollars and play, you know, with a group of people commanding a ship together. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, the local escape room set up an escape room in the game store we were in right behind where I was uh, streaming. And then like Sean said, we even streamed the whole thing last year. So we had people donating just from bellhop fans, uh, the the hop lights, the dingers, whatever we're going to call them, were able to support us online, which was pretty awesome. The whole thing is that was all last year. We didn't have a global pandemic last year. We, we were allowed to gather in public and we didn't worry about such things as having to wear masks or share game components. Because of what's happening this year in 2020, like most, if not all of what we just talked about was pretty much impossible, right? You, you, you were not supposed to gather in public in large numbers, no big group gaming, no tournaments, no baked good sales because there's no one to sell it to, no midnight pizza, and, and like, one that hurt the most, no cheat jars, and well, no auctions. Like I, we could have probably squeezed in a digital auction, but there's no way it would get the amount of attention and the people there looking to spend money. Not to mention the fact that doing a digital auction means either limiting it to only people in one specific area, Windsor or whatever, or dealing with shipping, which is worse than ever yeah, in this particular uh, type of year. So uh, these pointing on the chat room, you guys did use a cheat jar yes. and a swear jar during uh, your uh, Gloomhaven, yeah, it's our Gloomhaven stream. <laughs> okay. Yes, we, we 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 kept that we kept the tradition alive at least somewhat. Yeah. See, another part of the problem was some of this stuff we might have been able to do if we could have planned ahead. The problem is for anyone living in 2020 right now realizes this, but if you happen to be listening to this in the future, you can't plan anything. You have no idea what's going to happen two weeks from now or two months from now. Like we should have been planning this in March. If I had been planning this in March, I would have been planning to have a physical event still. I would have been planning to have something on tabletop day and we would have been planning to do all this stuff. But even if I backed up a month ago and we started planning this, I still would have probably expected something to happen at a local store. Right. And it got to the point where stuff's opened, then it's closed, then it's open, then you're allowed to, now you're not porch drop only. Like it's a mess. You have no idea what's going to happen. And it just wasn't worth trying to plan ahead. You don't know what's going to happen. So we kept putting things off. We kept talking about like, we do it. And it's in the back of our head. Extra life's coming up. We should probably do something, but what the heck are we going to do this year? And I'll admit, we probably waited a little too long, but we did get to a point where like, you know what? We got to do something. We got to take part. Let's keep the ball rolling. I don't want to lose the momentum. I want to be able to say we've taken part in extra life eight years in a row. Nine, if you count Jamie, but it was just Jamie. Fair enough. Nine in Windsor, if we count Jamie. But I, I want to keep that momentum. I want to be able to have the badge next to my name that shows participant for X many years in a row. I wanted our team to be out there so the team gets recognized. I wanted people to be able to help. Like the, the other part of it is we want to be able to make that donation. We want to be able to help out. Like despite there's a pandemic, maybe the Children's Miracle Network, well, not maybe, they still need the money. Maybe they need it more than ever. So we eventually decided there's not much we can do to make a big event. Like there's no real way to get people together, but what we can do is encourage people to do things on their own. Because right now we've got all social distancing, staying in our cohorts or staying in our social bubbles or whatever you want to call them. There's no reason that bubble or that group can't do their own thing. They can't get together with themselves and play games for 24 hours. And they can't fundraise. So that was the push. So we created the Windsor Windsor team again, the Windsor Extra Life team. We in, invited people to join and fundraise in their own way, whatever way that was, whatever they were comfortable with, whether that be gaming online, gaming with a social circle or social distance gaming at whatever, whatever FLGS, because a couple of the local stores are open and they are having some gaming, making sure to limit the number of people and making sure everyone's apart wearing masks, whatever people were comfortable doing, we encouraged them to do. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, there's there's a lot out there. Uh, and actually, some of the branding this year is fun. There's Counter-Strike COVID and Kills for <laughs> COVID. And, and some, of the, some of the digital folks are having some real fun with it. But again, oh, physical go. physical gaming in 2020, as we all know, you know, as, as everyone has learned about Zoom, uh, is a difficult event. Mm-hmm. And uh, with Canada being, uh, I think, more conservative, than, than some places and still having trouble. I mean, we are still, oh, yeah. uh, there, there's, we still haven't solved this yet. 
um, it's just not worth the risk when you're raising money for hospitals to be putting yourself at physical risk. Yeah. So one of the other things I did, again, kind of last minute, is I did reach out to the local stores and people who have taken part in Extra Life before. So one of the stores that, they, that we usually have a, a lot going on in is the CG Realm, and it just ends up that they were in the middle of a move. They just recently moved locations. And I actually wonder what would have happened if we had planned a physical event, because that would have been interesting, because they are not ready to invite a bunch of gamers in to start playing. But due to the fact they're moving, they didn't actually take part this year, which is fine. I fully understand. I reached out to Brimstone Games due to COVID. They weren't doing anything. But Tabletop Renaissance was willing to step up. So one of the things Solon did is he offered to donate 10% of his sales on Saturday to the cause, which is pretty dang awesome. The other thing he did is he actually ended up having an impromptu auction for a couple of rare items from his store at the time and raised some money that way. Brent from Hidden Trail Escape Rooms actually reached out to me and which was great because Brent has been there since that first year. He runs Hidden Trail Escape Rooms and has, has been there usually to provide uh, an escape room experience for part of our live auction. This year what he did is he gave us a code and then anyone who used that code to book a room last weekend, he donated four bucks per person who booked using that code. So that was cool. Like it was short notice, I admit it. But it was awesome to see at least a few people in the local community stepping up. And in addition to the store promotions, we did have a number of gamers join the team and start fundraising on their own, which was great to see. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's tough without the group promotion. Again, you know, when we when when everyone is united in a single cause, there can be mm -hmm. so much more marketing drive to get the information out there to people to drive the donations up, um, even for a home stream. Uh, and it, it's tough when, you know, again, we you don't know what's going on to organize yep. and get the, the message out there, get flyers and, you know, little uh, cards out at the, at the game stores and things to remind people uh, because you don't know what you're going to be doing. Yeah. Yeah, it was hard. That is one of the things we did not really get to today, this year, is we did not get really promotion out there rest of the city unfortunately i didn't end up on the news or anything like previous years or anything like that again we we probably could have started a little earlier but there was just so much going on and plus we didn't know what was going to happen now talking about plans changing at the last minute the original plan was for sean to come down to windsor and spend the 24 hours with us gaming which was going to be awesome and i was really looking forward to it like we keep talking on the show about the pile of games sean needs to try like including eclipse and a bunch of stuff We're like sean needs to play these sci-fi games but unfortunately that didn't work out either yeah, and right, right the week before, uh, one of my kids was sick, and they're fine, and everything was negative, but until that result came back, which unfortunately didn't happen until after the weekend, mm -hmm. it wasn't worth the risk, right? I, there's no, again, there's yeah. no point in taking part in a charity event to help hospitals when you could be getting people sick. Yeah. So even our plans got changed like the, the two days before we were about to, about to do everything. So since that didn't work out, what we did is we planned a mix of in-person and online gaming. Now we're going to get into which games we played later in the show during um, our Bellhops tabletop segment. But overall, it was kind of a mix of in-person and digital gaming. Um, we started off in my gaming basement playing some games together just d and i then later the kids joined and then deanna's mom came over and we played a game after dinner we had some great windsor style pizza uh we moved things online so we had lots of gaming on board game arena and then followed by some mmo gaming with just sean and i while i had the bellhop stream open in one window i didn't want to slack off at the beginning so i was streaming minecraft to make sure i was gaming yep. in one form or another for all 24 hours yeah, I, I'll admit I took a slight now. I, I took a little break, but there was always at least one of us gaming. So it, it definitely wasn't our usual extra life event. Like, like it definitely, I don't even know if it felt like it, like it, it kind of did. Like I, I kept saying it was extra life, but I don't know. It, I think it went pretty well given the circumstances. Um, I personally set my, my personal goal to raise money this year at 200 bucks, which is 10% of what I'd normally set it at, which is around 2000. And personally, I ended up raising over $330 us. So that blew away my expectations. Deanna got over a hundred dollars in Canadian donations. Um, Solon managed to raise $140 at Tabletop Renaissance. Brent's donating $50. Um, plus in addition to that, our team, the, the Windsor Extra Life team, Members were all raising money on their own as well. And at this point, we're up to over $600 US in donations, 
which nothing compared to being able to come out and say we made 6,000 or 8,000 or we're going to break 10,000 this year. This still really, to me, isn't that bad. And I think much better than I expected based on how this event ended up compared to our big hoopla that we have usually. Now, one important thing to note, even though game day is done, we are still accepting donations yep. and will be until the end of the year. So you're always free to drop by WindsorExtraLife.com and donate. Uh, and again, all that money goes straight to the hospitals. Yep. Does not pass go. Yeah, it's never too late to show your support for Extra Life. Um, like I said, Sean said, WindsorExtraLife.com. There's a button right at the top page that says Donate Now. Uh, technically, that goes to me directly, but if you want, click on the team page, find someone else on the team, donate to them. doesn't matter to us who it goes to. It all goes to the same place in the end. Uh, like Overall, it, it definitely wasn't our best year. But you know what? There were some pretty big mitigating circumstances this year. I'm glad we did something. Like There, there was a push for a long time to just, you know what? Forget it. It's not going to happen. You know what? We'll just make it better next year. But I think it was worth it just to keep the street going, to, to remind people that the charity exists, to keep the word out there like, oh, yeah, Windsor does an extra life thing every year. Uh, we did better than I thought we did, uh, which is awesome. And I got to admit, I really appreciate the support we did receive. So thank you, everyone who took part, donated, shared, supported our extra life efforts in any way. Well, that's it for our Extra Life 2020 wrap up. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see if our, anyone in our chat room has anything to add. So I didn't see anyone going by. Did anyone actually take part in Extra Life this year? Did anyone do anything this past weekend? Celebrate? I hate to celebrate. It always seems weird when I say it's like saying happy Extra Life. Yeah. Did anyone actually take a part this year? I don't, I know uh, like Jeff Seuss is in our chat room. And one of the things I miss is usually every year he runs a big DCC game that is the biggest moneymaker for the cheat chart. Because while well, DCC is deadly as heck, <laughs> and then Jeff running uh, DCC, he'll run it more deadly than usual. And the amount of money some people will keep to keep those uh, funnel characters alive is somewhat surprising. Well, it's all for a good cause. So you know what? Yeah, uh, it's true. If you're if you're in over your head, why not just dig a little deeper and uh, have fun? Have fun spending. It's, it's the only, it, it, I think he pointed out the one year that it was the most characters that have ever survived a funnel before, but it made us like a good chunk of cash for that. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we ended up donating 20 bucks just in our Gloomhaven game. So what we were doing in our Gloomhaven game was every time we made a rule mistake or we, we were we were charging people, uh, we were charging ourselves a buck. And every time we swore, we put a swear jar out and charged ourselves a buck. And it was, it was about 20 bucks by the end of the event. And we'll cover it later, but it was a tough game. So cheating and uh, or, yeah. or making mistakes and swearing were uh, were flowing pretty freely in that one. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, I see. I, th I think Evil John is in our chat room. He usually takes part. Like it, it was just weird. Yeah. Like you were saying, even the numbers that were up there for the top teams were way lower. I, I mean, Watsi Watsi had their their magic, you know, team, and it was kind of a, a tiny little amount i mean it was it was yeah. i mean it wasn't a it small, was significant it was, it was a but significant yeah. amount but compared to the numbers you're used to seeing at an extra life uh you know like last year was weird because they they were actually um attacked uh the site was actually well yeah last year there the were site was, issues was attacked donations. and there were a number of issues and they still you know made a you know notable amount of money uh yeah. especially because people would just come in the day afterwards and donate and things to to make up for it Whereas, you know, this year it was just, uh, you know, sa a sad number. It wasn't, I mean, yeah. it was, it was a good number the, the hospitals I'm sure will appreciate it, but it wasn't the kind of number that, yeah. uh, extra life is used to putting out. Plus like, I don't think Dungeons and Dragons took part this year where last year, like the, like the critters, I, I'm pretty sure they did a live stream. Like there were some, I think Jeremy Crawford ran a game and like the Chris Perkins ran a extra life game. Like there were some big names running 24 hour D and D streams. And I admit, I didn't see any of that this year and possibly it just wasn't advertised well, but I don't think they did. Like, I don't think there was a big D and D extra life push this year. It just, there's so much other stuff going on and I get it. It's like I said, we almost skipped it this year, but we decided not to. Well, uh, there were some big events like in January, they announced uh, the first inaugural Extra Life Hackathon. And this was going to be a uh, development push specifically to try and help um, all technology, hospital-based technology, actually. Mm. actually. Uh, and then they were going to start that in January 
and I believe April or May, they were going to fly the top four competitors out to Florida to present to judges uh, right. and things. Well, no one was flying anywhere for something like that yeah. in May. So, um, yeah, it was an un unprecedented so time. So Dungeons & Dragons did that. technically take part, uh, okay. but the Dungeons & Dragons team made less than $300,000. Wow. Yeah, which is a shockingly low like number. Like that is a I mean, shockingly low number. It's a great amount of money, awesome, yes. but at the same time, compared to prior years, yes. uh, Magic: The Gathering did almost get to uh, a million. Huh. All, they, so they almost did it, but they almost did it. So, like the overall total, I think I saw was fifteen million, which I think is I don't know what their numbers that's are. That's not this year. That's, one. that's not a number from this year. There's no way. See, I thought it was. That was that was tweeted by them on the day of the event. The, Mm, the top two teams barely make a million. Uh, Let's see if I can so find it quickly here. I, I would be I would be sh shocked. Hey Sean, here's a section you can edit. Oh yeah, this is. <laughs> yeah, where's where's like their official account? Okay, what yeah. So it? so do you saying they definitely said they broke twelve million? Uh, yeah, it was twelve. Oh yeah, right there, there up go. there. Yep. So there, yeah, yeah right at the top at the, at the. Yeah, I was gonna say. It, okay, I thought it was year 15, to date. 12. So. Yeah, but that's from January on. But that's right, and that includes corporate sponsorships, I believe. Yep. So, yep. Um, that's not that's not the the teams raising money. That's all the money that they've made. Yeah, yeah, that's year. all the money they got. But the, so they still made twelve million, which is yeah. good. But like, I, the extra life, their website's terrible for seeing what happened last year. We have this problem every year because we want to find it overall what we've raised since we started, and we have difficulty finding that every year. All righty, so. I think that's it for um, our Extra Life wrapped up tonight. And remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, just head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me directly at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables, virtual or Every otherwise? Yes. Every week we like to take this look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. And this week we got all three, really, because the big thing that happened was the Extra Life 24-Hour Charity Gaming Marathon, a worldwide event that raises money for the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Now, as mentioned earlier in the show tonight, usually this is a huge deal for us. Like, honestly, in Windsor, it's the biggest public gaming event of the year. Um, almost like a small gaming convention. That wasn't meant to be in 2020 due to the global pandemic. With shifting timelines for what is allowed, where, and when, and constant concerns for the health of everyone involved, another casualty of 2020. Yeah, we didn't, it, 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 it did take some damage, that's for sure, but we did keep it alive. So what we did is we encouraged other gamers uh, and ourselves to hold their own Extra Life 24-hour gaming event. Um, we had one of our own for the three of us, the entire Bellhop team, that had a mix of both physical and online gaming. And we encouraged other people to game in their own homes or take part in uh, appropriately safe fashions. Even if we couldn't take over a store and game together as one, we <laughs> could still get our game on for charity. Yeah, so what we ended up doing is we went with just 24 hours straight, starting at 11 a.m. on Saturday, going to 11 a.m. on Sunday. That was going to be the 24-hour window of gaming. Um, we started off 11 a.m. on Saturday. We live streamed the whole thing, got the stream up and running, um, I think on time even for that one, and started off with a special Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion actual play. So what happened was Deanna and I rescheduled our Friday night game for Saturday morning, just uh, we weren't going to do both, and played through scenario number 19, which was the um, Den of, excuse me, Den of Thieves. This was an interesting one. Um, once getting things set up, we had uh, a lot more room than usual on the stream, which was interesting. So positioning things took a little lot longer because it was only a two-pager and featured lots and lots of vermlings and it was our first um it, it was close it, it was our first time to have a, a character get exhausted part way through um it wasn't looking good uh for most of the game i think deanna had called it 
uh, about halfway through. Didn't think we were going to get through that one. Um, I got to learn just how well the Void Warden can tank, which is not very well, but well enough. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, what was interesting is this was our first side quest. So this is this was our first. We didn't progress the main plot at all. This was, hey, go here and keep dealing with the blood cultists or check out these, uh, I want to say Skaven, Vermlings off to the side. And we decided to check out the Vermlings off to the side. And that was definitely interesting. And I, I'm wondering if, if similar to Gloomhaven, if the side quests are actually ramped up in difficulty to the base, the base game. It was uh, definitely interesting to watch. Uh, I had basically sort of given up on on you guys winning. <laughs> I I I was shocked when I kept realizing you guys are still going. Oh, yeah. I thought this was over. I thought you. I thought it it was done. I thought you. And no, no, you're you're still plugging through and slogging through. You know, uh, vermling bodies piled up around you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The last for whom were those monstrous rats or, or something rats? I think it was monstrous rats, and I don't know how many waves of rats I managed. I managed to get myself into a nice corner where only two of them could get to me, and there were two of the weaker, not the elite ones. And it was just a matter of living through their attacks. And how my, my, our our luck was garbage that entire game. Oh. Like we should have won that like six turns earlier. Like it's just if you throw up any card but this, nope, there's that card. Card, card pull the first card pull oh. of the game was off and it yep. went downhill from there. Oh, it was terrible. Like like it's like no matter what, if I do at least one damage, we're gonna win this. I only have two cards in my entire deck where that won't happen. Oh, there's the miss. Like it was that bad. And yeah. it just kept happening. And I, I was gonna be so frustrated if we had lost due to that. But it worked out. I, I was shocked. I didn't think we were going to get through that one. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait to get this one on um, on YouTube due to the fact that I don't know what's going on. Like, I think it's because we had the camera run too long. So the files are bigger or there's more files. But our way to transfer files isn't working. And I've been trying for two days now to get Sean the um, the video here so we can splice it and edit it. Because we're using that. Uh, the second camera does weird things where it cuts out every five gigs or so i don't know what it is time it's a time it's a time thing so it runs for a certain amount of time and then uh you know basically saves the file and starts again quickly yeah so we were able to get the files i was able to get them three out of five so far after the show is done tonight i'll try to get them another one but i think i might have to wait till tomorrow which also means i'm not gonna be able to get you the audio for this right away uh, i could uh, that i should be able to do yeah that one that one should work in google so yeah i should be able to use google to get my one so if anyone knows free software for transferring large files, we would love the uh, suggestion because what we were using somehow, for some reason this week stopped. And yeah. It I, I think, like it I think the next, I think our next best option is going to be that Terra share. Um, but yeah, I don't even know what's up with that. I, I can't have it. It won't find the files on my PC to send them. Right. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to, I, again, yeah. there's something weird about this whole thing this time. So we'll just, Hopefully yeah. it's it's we'll we'll write it off and start again fresh next yeah. week and, and everything it's just, will start uh, this working week, again. And uh, this week's <laughs> been a mess. So while that was going on on the physical table over at the Bellhop's house, I started in the purely digital realm with some Minecraft um, as a treat and to myself and perhaps to some viewers. I was playing a snapshot beta version that's only been out a week or two, but contains a huge wealth of new content for the Minecraft game. That isn't going to be in full release until next summer. Wow. I decided I'd start a, a new world for extra life. And I started right from scratch and just got to mining and crafting. Yeah, I didn't check that out. We were too busy playing Gloom, so I didn't get to see any of that. What What are the new features in this beta that people might want to check out? Uh, so they have added uh, a bunch of new blocks. There's actually now uh, Amethyst is now a thing within the game. Uh, and also, really uh, interestingly, Copper is now a new ore. Okay. Uh, and on top of everything else, copper actually ages. So it actually mm. oxidizes over time <laughs> within the game. Uh, and fun things like you can use your copper and your amethyst to create, to craft a spyglass uh, and, and, you know, okay. look off, look off into the distance a little easier without using uh, mods and stuff like that. And there's a bunch of little things. Uh, I know I was talking with Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton the other day, and he's really excited about the fact that uh, path blocks can now be made out of both dirt and grass and podzol and mycelium, not just from normal grass the way they are currently, uh, which is a, a, a huge feature to those people who, who understand what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you went off into the, the, the part of Minecraft where I'm like, no, now I have no clue what he's talking about. Copper oxidizing, that makes sense. Yep. New things to make, spyglasses, that all made sense. But <laughs> half blocks, nope, no clue. <laughs> all right, after we finished Gloomhaven, which did go way longer than we thought because, wow, that was tough. And, and the, it just kept bragging because we thought it was going to be over one way or another. Um, we started a little later than we wanted, but we got the kids to come over and we broke out a brand new game to us, well, new to us game, and that is Harry Potter House Cup Competition. Uh, first off, I do have to say thanks to the kids for our pa their patience because, man, did we have a lot of technical issues. Like, we had tested the stream the night before and it was, I would say, fragile at best, but I got it to work, but it was not working at this time. Now, the laptop we use is not designed to handle two camera inputs and the mic. It ends up all three of those together, pushes it beyond its USB limits. Now, we did manage to get it to work, but uh, even once it was working, we were still having problems with cameras freezing pretty much randomly, as far as I can tell it. First, we thought it was a connection issue, but then it would just happen in the middle of us playing. So I don't know. Yeah, sadly, adding the lights to the setup was much more cost effective than a new computer. We're still yeah. working on that tonight, though, as it was, and this weekend was about the charity and giving to hospitals, not working on our stuff. Yeah, we could definitely still use the, uh, we're, we're still working on the new PC angle, but yeah, uh, I don't think we're going to be trying the two camera thing again. So uh, for those of you who watch our Gloomhaven streams, it's not coming anytime soon. I do apologize. Hopefully before the end of the year, but definitely not in the next couple of weeks, because man, that was a mess. Like it, it, it was frustrating. It didn't make sense. Stuff would work and then cut out and I'd switch scenes and all of a sudden something be gone. Oh, it was, it was extremely frustrating. And like I said, thanks to the kids for putting up with that. Now, as for Harry Potter House Cup competition, uh, this is one I think people are going to be very excited about for fans of Harry Potter. This is a very light yet solid worker placement game. And the more I played, the more it kept reminding me of Lords of Waterdeep. And there are so many people that push Lords of Waterdeep as the gateway worker placement game. And I think this may even replaced it for that. Though I do have to say the theme is even more pasted on than in Lords of Waterdeep, if not at the same level. I would say even less. It, it's even more pasted on. Like, you don't even get artwork, or at least Lords of Waterdeep, you get a picture of a dragon or a beholder or something. You don't even get that here. Everything's sing symbols. So this is a game. It's worker placement where you have three workers. You have your three students. Each of the players is one of the four different houses. And you are going to take your students and send them to various places at Hogwarts, the library or classes or... Uh, the apothecary. I can't even remember all the spots on the board. In addition, there are random buildings that are put out that get added to the game. And that's another part that reminds me of Waterdeep. But instead of being built by the players, they're just randomized at the start of the game. You're going to go around and collect knowledge and magic. You're going to complete lessons to get some bonuses, all with the goal of finishing challenges. And the challenges come in two levels, easy and hard challenges. Each round, your goal is to try to complete two, if you can. Like, that seemed to be the thing. And at the beginning, you're going to be stuck to probably trying to complete little easy challenges moving on to the harder ones eventually you can only do one of each the kids really liked it i i thought it was way deeper than i thought it would be like i read it and went oh it's a gateway worker placement you're collecting stuff to finish stuff you're collecting these resources then trading them in to get points basically but it was there was way more pre-planning required than i thought and another big aspect of this that actually feels more dnd like than water deep is you level up your characters as you're playing when you send your characters to classes they get better at um charms potions and defense of the dark arts being your three main classes i thought it was solid uh the kids seemed to really like it but man it took a long time like the box says 75 minutes and i think we were well over two hours by the time we were done and that combined with the delay of getting things going did have my youngest a bit bored but you know what she stuck with it to the end yeah, and I have to say, the theme is very curiously pasted on. Uh, Potterheads, myself included, having watched it, uh, will get frustrated at some of the things the game enabled because they're using named characters from the movies. Uh, okay. I feel like the game would have been stronger in the Potterverse theme if they had avoided official characters, right? If they hadn't mm -hmm. used... Harry and Hermione and Draco and, you know, these characters that everyone knew and just gone with either, you know, named characters, but not primary characters right. or something, but kept the Hogwarts school theme. I mean, the, the classes and the, and the, the, the school works, 
but having you know having these you know having harry doing doing this 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 stuff that everyone immediately assumes is a slytherin thing or having the slytherins you know achieve all this wonderful fantastic stuff <laughs> that should be reserved for you know the the protagonists um grinds the wrong way a little bit and i mean yeah fine it's a game and and you know it's it's great when slytherin all of a sudden achieves things but it would have been better to have slytherin achieve it without the uh thought of that evil draco mm. being the one to do it yeah another thing the kids point out and deanna's pointing out the chat too was timeline issues that they had events from all seven years of the story kind of happening at once and overlapping each other. Yeah. Uh, her biggest complaint was Cedric Diggory having tea with Doris Umbridge, which that I don't get that reference myself. So I will say for one thing, if you don't know Potter or, or vaguely know Potter, because I, I, I know of it, I played some of the video games and I, I did watch the movies. Um, I think most of them, if not all of them, it didn't matter. Like it, it really didn't matter what you were doing. Though the kids did get a kick out of it. So like they were really upset that that um that Slytherin formed uh, Dumbledore's army. That was the one that broke my kids. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know. It was worth sixty points. I gotta admit, it does have probably the coolest scoring mechanism I've ever seen in a game. Not mechanic, not mechanism. Scoring physicality, the the way yep. you do it, which is a bunch of plastic test tubes that you actually put in gems. And you put in these little plastic gems and they fill up the test tubes to see what level each house is at. And I actually really love that mechanically because you couldn't quite tell where anyone was at. So like it, it, you get the advantage of kind of seeing if someone's gaining a lead, but you never know if you're quite ahead of them or not. So it doesn't quite have that chase the leader problem, but still gives you some information on who's like, you know, a, Little G's not doing so well. I'm not going to pick on her. I'm going to pick on Big G, who seems to be doing really well. And, oh, look, her mom seems to be past her. It's time to start aiming that way. And I, I was really impressed by that. It looks cool, and it's thematic. That's that's the one part. Yeah, and it's, it's actually, it is actually not the same as, but similar in a similar vein to the way that the that Hogwarts actually keeps score for the House Cup. Yeah. Uh, whereas they, it's, it's, it's a little more... Um, uh, uh, hourglass ish in the in okay. the in the movies but still it's a similar concept of you know piling up these little things to to see who's winning and so they they really did go on theme with that yeah i did like that one quite a bit so overall i i gotta admit i was impressed the kids seem impressed we're gonna give this one a few more tries and then we'll be doing an official review of this one um thanks the op for sending us a review copy probably should have said that at the top here um actually quite a few of the games we mentioned now maybe eh, maybe no, most of what we are playing tonight isn't actually review copies, but that was, so I should have said that from the top. But yeah, I got to say, it, it captured the feel, and I think for fans of the series, this is a great, like, this, this was a great way for my kids to learn what a worker placement game was. I really think it is. It's, I, it's the first they played, and now they get the whole send your student to do a thing and get something for it, and then trade in a bunch of that stuff to get something else, right? That That's a pretty tried and true mechanic nowadays. Yeah. Uh, despite the fact only being invented in my lifetime since Kalis came out, it feels like it's been around longer, but like now my kids have familiarity with that. And I, I got to say, like, if you like D&D, go with this. If you like Harry Potter, go with this. Because uh, they're definitely uh, a great introduction to that mechanic. Uh, up next, we played a three-player game of Chronicles of Crime 1400. Uh, Deanna's mom came over to join us for this one. She had played the first case with us. Uh, this time we are playing the second crime out of four, which, uh, got to say, proved to be much harder than the first one. And, well, the tutorial, obviously. Uh, this had some neat new stuff. Again, I'm, I'm seeing the functionality and added bonus of using an app with a video game or with a board game, sorry, with a board game and what that can add to the game. And the one thing it did was I didn't realize it was doing this, but it makes sense it's doing this as it was keeping track of what items you had shown to each character and reacting accordingly. So, for example, I don't want to spoil anything here, but at one point we were told to keep something a secret. Then we went somewhere else and talked about that thing. And that ended up really pissing off the person who told us to keep it a secret and actually put a big roadblock in our investigation. Like that was a big mistake that we made by doing that. Now I kind of suggested at the table and I'm like, I don't know. Um, so that, that was interesting to see it work. Now Deanna does want us to point out at the time that there was a bit of ambiguity, how one particular item in this worked. Now, again, I don't want to spoil anything, but there is 
in this game, we've talked about it before, so I don't want to give a full overview, but you're going to get clue cards, and the clue cards are generic. So it'll say like notes and letters, or it'll say melee weapon, and it can represent different things. Well, in this particular case, one item, one card, seemed to be representing two different pieces of information, and we were having a hard time getting the app to realize which part of the information we were talking about, or we were not understanding which part of the information the app was going to pick, because it's not like you got an option. So we're like, we're going to talk to this person about this thing. And you're like, no, 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 it's talking to him about this other thing. And we get punished for it. So that that was my first complaint about the Chronicles of Climb series. Now, I don't know if this is something that carries over from the original games, but this definitely was um, where we got the frustration of using an app because this is something, what exactly does something represent, right? Like we know as players sitting down playing this game, that if we were this character, we would go interview this person about this. And then getting to figure out how to do that in the app was harder than it should be. We're like, well, we want to talk to them about this. Do we scan this card or this card? Which, so there, there's, it, it's not the shining example I found in the first two. I wasn't like, oh my God, the app's awesome. Now I'm like, okay, I can see a few of the, the, the problems with the system. Yeah, there seemed as a viewer to be a lot of frustration with the system more than the mystery itself uh, because yeah. of the way the game is set up. Doing something that is simple, um, like you know, I want to, you know, I'm if I'm at a if I'm at a place and I want to do this one thing, it's not always immediately obvious how to do that. Whereas you yes. know exactly what it is you want to do. Mm -hmm. I want to do this. Because I think it's involved in the case. There's no way to just immediately say, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so there's some frustration and I don't know whether it's uh, familiarity with the system or, uh, you know, just the way, the way people were referring to things and, and just where that difficulty is, but there was mm -hmm. definitely some system based uh, struggles yes. in that particular play. Yeah, it's so hard to talk about without talking about what <laughs> no, actually happened. I know. I'm like this thing we want you know to exactly do what I thing. you know exactly oh, yeah, what yeah. I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. And then like there's just other stuff, right? You're like, I want to ask this person about this location, but you can't ask about locations. You can only ask about items. Okay. Or you have a dog. That's not a spoiler. You have a dog with you. Well, the dog, you want to talk to the dog about the person, but you can't because the dog only actually interacts with items. And then a bit that this one actually is frustrating and dumb, in my opinion, is if you ac activate the dog and then scare, scan a location or a person, it costs you time. That shouldn't happen. Like if the mechanics of the game is it can only scan items, it should just tell me the dog only scans items. Don't punish me right. for scanning the wrong thing. Like just a, hey, remember. So one thing that I thought was interesting. So we did pretty poorly overall. Um, part of it, I think, being due to the spoiling that one thing earlier, another not realizing how to make certain things interact, we ended up getting 40 out of 100 points and did not, honestly, in my opinion, solve the main case. Now, the points what we did get were basically for a side plot, like something that happened in the middle of the story. We were able to figure out who did what and why, but we didn't get the, the, the core clues, the, the main story. And what's interesting about this, especially compared to what I've said about the game previously on the podcast or on our, uh, or even on the blog, is that we're going to replay this. And it's going to be interesting because I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work out. Because I had always thought, you know what, once you've solved it, why would you play it again? But you know what, we only solved part. And when we finished it, we had the option. I could have read the solution and found out why and how and what we missed. Like we do know one particular item we missed out on that we know we need to get that item to solve it. I would have figured, no, you're done. We failed. No, we're going to go back. So we're going to actually try the game again. So part of it, yeah, we're going to be able to skip through quickly because we know the results. But uh, like, for example, that one secret, we'll keep the secret next time and see how that plays out. So yeah. there's actually a level of replayability to this game that I didn't realize was there on previous plays. Yeah, it's handy that you can take another run at it and avoid certain pitfalls that you know are there and perhaps make the right moves. <laughs> Though I can see that it is not so easy that knowing what you know now, a second run is still a guaranteed success. No, I don't think it is. I don't, like, we'll know that one side plot and what happened there, but that's it. Uh, Deanna's pointing out an amusing aspect is it's Chronicles of Crime Tragedy Looper Edition, and that's exactly it. 
Hey, the character you play is prescient. So yep. there, there is that. So there you go. We're even sticking with the theme. Yep. So yeah, there is definitely something to be said for replaying a case to try to get a perfect score without hitting the solution. So we're, we're going to do that. So it's, it's cool to see that the game has more replayability than I thought. So at this point, it had actually gotten surprisingly late. Like uh, I realized it's only three games, but those games took a long time. Um, all of them took significantly longer than we thought. It was it was nighttime by this point. So we got some Windsor style pizza from Capri. And while waiting for that to show up, we're like, you know what? We I don't want to sit downstairs. Let's let's move things upstairs to, to here on the PC into the office. And we started playing some games on board game arena. Now it ends up we stayed online for the rest of the event, which I gotta admit, one of the big reasons being that you know my game room is pretty comfortable. It's now very well lit, and the chairs are comfortable, you think for one or two games, but after about 12 hours, those chairs aren't so comfortable anymore and things start going numb or sore. Um, as Deanna pointed it out, you don't realize how much it hurts until you get up to do something else. And then you're like, Ooh, I can barely walk. <laughs> so yeah, once we got upstairs to the comfy office chairs, it was a little hard to leave those. Yeah. I didn't have Windsor pizza, not that I'm bitter, but I do have a very <laughs> nice chair. So there you go. I'm good. You had the chair. So the first thing we did is all three of us finished up a game. So we had a game at Clans of Caledonia going from before I Extra Life finished out that game. Um, that went fairly well. That was a closer game than I thought. Uh, both Yana and I had some good try. I think you had your best I showing king, ever I, too. Yeah, and I, 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 was, I ended up being Kingmaker on that one uh, mm. because you would have taken it if I hadn't uh, yeah. if I had stretched out. If you hadn't out. cut me off, if you hadn't cut me in half, <laughs> divided my territories in two so that my provinces are i can never remember what they're called in that game yeah. what, what my my colonies couldn't hook up so i i lost out on those points i thought i had that one deanna had a money making thing going there that i've never even seen before she had so much money yeah that was that was insane that, that was she, was, she was she was in the three digit coins there that was just wrong yeah that was crazy still loving clans of caledonia uh, yep. the, really digging that game loving trying out the uh the different clans and stuff like that um deanna was playing the ones who could make sell their milk for for good money and made 117 coins in the last round where i think i was making like 38 i was i was my first time playing the uh that race race sorry i'm used to terra mystica clan. that clan with uh you get extra money when you buy and sell and well i came in second so i guess it worked well enough but i found them a little hard to play it's not as hard as the fishermen the fishermen are the one one clan in that game i can't figure out yeah i should uh i should figure that out uh so next we sat down we're like we got to try to find something new to play something the three of us can play that'll be exciting for people to watch because we were live streaming this sean was streaming it on his channel we were streaming it here at tabletop Bella or twitch.tv slash tabletop Bella. um so we decided to try out the crew uh, this came up a lot. So a week ago, we were talking about best trick taking games and everyone was like the crew. Are you going to talk about the crew? Jeff in our chat room was like, I was waiting till the end. You didn't mention the crew. What's going on? And yes, we threw it in our own mentions because we hadn't played the game. And I got to say, people were right. Now that I played it, I'll admit we only played on BGA. This totally belonged in the main list. It, it, it should have been a top 11 list or whatever. We should have had this in there. The crew is fantastic. This is a, I don't know how many people have played, to be honest. We were playing three players. Uh, I'm going to guess like one say, to five, but I don't I wanna know. Say, I want to say three to six or something like that. It's, yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Sean will probably look it up while yeah. we're doing it. So this is a trick-taking game where there's what? Three different suits plus the rockets. This shows how much we played the game. We got multiple suits yeah. and rockets that go. Uh, the rockets only go one to four, and they're always trump. So the same suits always trump every time you play. And then the other ones go from one to eight or nine. Maybe it's one to nine. I think one it's to one, nine. To nine. It was one to nine. Uh, one to nine and one, one to, to nine four and one rockets. to four. And, and I think four, there's three four different colors, colors. Four, four colors, colors plus the rockets, and it plays two to five players. Two to five. Okay. So what this is, is a cooperative trick taking game where you're not allowed to talk much where you're trying to beat the mission and there's 50 missions in the box. And we started at mission one and I think we played to mission six or so. And the first one is just one person has to get a certain card. So it'll say like the blue two, which is a pretty easy one. Someone has to get the blue two and then every card's in play every game. So you can do your card counting here and you're going to look at it. And the person with the blue two is, is, has got to win that suit or you have to make sure a certain person gets it. And you're going to play a trick taking even to make sure they get it. So it's a, it's a matter of, you know, 
you throw the blue two and then someone throws the blue eight and then the person who wants it throws the blue eight and then the other person throws in a blue two or three or whatever to make sure the two goes to them. And then as you go on, it'll be a specific number. And then it might be, you need to get each get a different number. And then the next time might be you have to get this number before this number. And then one of them was really neat because the captain got to pick who was sick. And then the sick crew member couldn't take any suits, any tricks whatsoever. That was one of the more interesting ones. And I got to say, I really liked that on Board Game Arena for a couple things. For one, you could see which cards people had played. So it did the card counting for you, which I totally missed, but was over in the description. Plus, it was just really well implemented. The way it explained how to do things, the iconography was really good. Um, there's a whole system for that I don't think we use to its full effect for sending information to your teammates. Yeah. Uh, which was something to do with you tap the card and then by your next turn you would tell someone I don't have this suit, this is the lowest card I have in the suit or this is the highest card I have in the suit. Yeah, there's a communication phase that is sort of like um, a reverse Hanabi where you can say certain information about a card in your hand but limited there is no table talk allowed which yeah. actually made for an interesting twitch stream uh well, we had yeah. to find things to talk about that wasn't the game um, or at least wasn't directly related to our hands Mm -hmm. um so that was that was actually kind of and that was actually part of the fun of it was uh you know having conversations while playing but not talking about your hands yeah uh, made yep. for an interesting uh aspect now the two complaints i would have about the crew is i i still play games better with physical physicality in my hands i don't know what it is same way i i can't win only tom online i i lost at hive later like I don't know what it is. I need to touch stuff, I think, to play games. So you definitely lose out on that, that holding the cards. But the other thing is, is I would not, now that we're doing it and it's off, I don't want to play this not real time. Yeah. Because we technically still have that game going and it's so hard to remember who was trying to get what and what card. Like, yes, I know all the list of what cards were there is on the right-hand side, but I think this has to play real time. Like, I, I want to, I, even on BGA, like... This is, I, I think what we should do is uh, we'll get together with John this weekend maybe and play some of the crew. I think that might be what we could do. Yeah. Spend a few hours trying to work through some of that because that would be another one for us chit chat and listen to the 80s music while playing the game at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's definitely a real time. I mean, you know, I can, I can see, you know, holding the cards or not is one thing, but playing this spread out with your turn oh, spread out over days is just going to be painful. You need yeah. to actually be yeah. in the flow like that's the flow is part of the game uh there's so, yeah. a really good reason why this is the number three family game on bgg right now oh it's 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 really good this is now now it's on my hey anyone listening who buys me christmas presents <laughs> this is one i think i want to physically own i think this would be a great one for breaking out and i think you play it like you don't need the same players like there's 50 missions i think you just take whatever your copy is and whoever you play with you slowly go through them Right. Like if I show up the, to, to the local game store three months from now, it's like, all right, I'm up to number 37. Who's ready to go now? I'm, I'm going to guess they're probably pretty difficult at that point. But yeah, it's there's probably I mean, you probably need to have played some of the early ones to understand yeah. the flow. But, you know, hey, have you ever never played before? OK, let's play missions one to three real quickly. And then yeah, we'll hop just to over get you and, the idea and play. But I think that's what I do. I would have my own campaign version played with groups of different people. Yep. So I admit, once we hit to about number six or five, I just started making bad moves. <laughs> like, just dumb. You were, like, you were struggling You need with the that. suit. I'll play the nine. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I, I admit, I had like an hour and a half sleep the night before Extra Life, which is just a really dumb idea. It wasn't planned. I think I was just nervous about Extra Life for streaming. So I needed a bit, bit of a break. So I took a short nap. Now, Deanna stayed up. And you and Deanna, Sean and Deanna, continue to play games on Board Game Arena, which I think you started off with one of the ones you taught me in the past. Absolutely. So Jaipur is a great two-player game. Uh, and again, it, it is a trick-taking game of, of sorts. Um, sorry, you know, in a, in a manner of speed. And I'm not a great teacher of games, especially after 13 hours <laughs> of online playing or so. But the game itself and on top of that, BGA's implementation of it are really conducive to just picking it up and going. Um, I think she trounced me three games to one or something. So she obviously got the hang of it. Um, and uh, right now she is talking about uh, having, you know, getting a physical copy of it. And while I agree, I want a new version of it. And apparently there is talk of a deluxe version coming out. Uh, but 
the the cardboard tokens on this are just wrong it needs clay yes. it it needs uh, poker chips or clays or something better than the cardboard tokens it deserves more um and apparently the art that is in the app version may be coming out in the new mm. new release coming that's uh, it was supposed to be a 2020 but well it's 2020 so yeah. who knows <laughs> Yeah, this is one that happens to be part of the Amazon sale we were talking about earlier. And when I saw the price point on this game, I'm like, that seems awfully high. Like at first, Sean was the same thing. He's like, well, it's not high because you get your poker chips. And I'm like, no, it's just cardboard tokens. Like for a bunch of cards, yeah. it seemed a little too high uh, a price point for what you get. Now, yeah. again, if I'm going to go with the number of times we're going to play the game and the quality of the game, sure, it's probably justified. But just for what uh, a bunch of playing cards and cardboard chips. Yeah, now they're I solid the cardboard chips. Price. I mean, you can see in the images they are a good thick um, cardboard token, but it's still just a cardboard token. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I found the price point a bit off on that. One. Yep. No, absolutely. But uh, moving on from that, after uh, we we played a few games of that, we were we were both burning out as well. I mean, you'd you'd gone for a, a little lay down, and but we weren't uh, we were feeling it as well. So we wanted something light and two-player friendly that wasn't real brain burning. Uh, so we jumped in to King Domino. Um, you know, nice, light Domino land. Uh, and aside from me forgetting one thing in our first game that that, that cost me uh, the game, even if it, I hadn't been playing against D and going to get trounced anyway, uh, it was just a nice, fun couple of light plays. It, again, the implementation on, uh, on BGA is solid. Mm -hmm. uh, I they possibly could have found a better way to do rotation of dominoes. But other than that, I mean, that's a pretty minor complaint. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's, that's about the only thing I could think of them changing on the BGA uh, implementation of it. All right. After my way too short nap, um, I got up, logged back into board game arena. Deanna tapped out for the night. Uh, Sean and I spent some time talking about what to play. We did take turns on our, our existing games usually we talk about the show all the time we always have a bunch of games going one of those existing games that popped up for me was seven wonders and i'm like wait a minute sean's never played seven wonders duel i'm like all right how about we sit down i'll teach you seven wonders duel it's a two-player only game i love seven wonders duel especially when compared to seven wonders like it's it's a solid two-player game but like I honestly, I'm not a huge fan of Seven Wonders, but I really like Duel. I think it's better than the original. I would rather play Seven Wonders Duel over Seven Wonders anytime, but of course it doesn't work with seven people. So I do get the appeal of Seven Wonders. Now, this was your first time playing Seven Wonders Duel. What'd you think? Uh, I loved it. It's far superior to Seven Wonders. Yeah. Uh, you know, I play Seven Wonders on BGA because we can. It's just, it's there. You can, it's really easy to play turn-based with, you mm -hmm. know, not worrying about uh, real time and so that's why i play seven wonders but to say that i like seven wonders would be a bit of a stretch it's just <laughs> kind of a fine game there's nothing wrong with it but it's not a okay. great game whereas seven wonders duel i really enjoyed and i you yeah. know got I, I uh i you know got caught out uh on that second game not paying attention yeah. and, and not understanding how many things i should be paying attention of but duel <laughs> is definitely a superior game yeah, that was where I won with a military victory. Yeah. So it's one of those, if you're not paying attention, the first game he let me collect too many, uh, uh, what do you call them, whatever, victory point cards, the blue yeah. cards. And then the second game I snuck in on the military win. So yep. I just, the way you draft cards, the way it works, the way you get money for your cards, it's just, oh, it's such a smoother yep. system. Absolutely. Even the, the drafting, this the eight wonders at the beginning of the game is well done and knowing when to convert them over, just the decision points are better. I, I still, and, and I got to say, that was my first time playing on Board Game Arena. It worked fantastic. Like, I would actually say better than in person in a way because there's too much to track right. in the original game, especially how many yellow cards you have so that when you're going to sell a card, how much you get, yep. you get two plus. Like, it does all that math, right? Plus, if you mouse over the green cards, the the, the green chips, the things you, you get for having technologies, it tells you what they all do which every time I play the physical version, it's grab the rule book, look up what that stupid green thing does. Yeah. And then someone uses the wonder where they get to pull green things out of the box. You got to look those up. It was so much less fiddly. So I, I think this is going to become a new favorite of mine on board game arena. Absolutely. 
So once we finished off uh, Seven Wonders, I'm like, all right, I taught you one of my favorite games. How about you teach me one of yours? And you ended up showing me Rallyman GT, which I know you play all the time on uh, Board Game Arena. Yeah, and I've been playing four to six player matches of this on BGA for quite a while. And while it's not best at two player, it's a really good way to get a feel for the mechanics uh, because sometimes... Uh, you can get some really longer, long games or long turn breaks in the four mm -hmm. to six players just because there's all there's a lot to think about sometimes. Yeah, for me, it was I, I was surprised by it. It just wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Now, I don't know exactly what I thought it was going to be, but it was definitely different than what I thought it was going to be. I think I expected more of a euro, like a, a more of a mechanical, crunchy game, something more like Thunder Road, which is a, a fantastic NASCAR based game from GMT Games. And it, this was way lighter, like, like really light. Like th this reminded me of maybe a little higher than the easy mode in Formula D where you don't do wear and everything, but like, and, and, and Thunder Road kind of in the middle there, but definitely more on the Formula D side. Um, well, being at least similar, right? Cause it was still, it's still dice driven. It's still, it's a very different dice driven. And it was really neat to see how it was done differently. This is actually closer of all things, to Monza, which is a kid's game we've talked about before. Where Monza, you roll a bunch of dice, and then you place the dice out onto the map in different squares that match the colors on the dice, and then go forward that many squares. This is kind of that, except the difference is you're going to roll, it doesn't matter the color of the dice, but you're going to roll the dice to see if you were, roll, what, caution symbols, whatever they represent. And if you roll too many caution symbols, you spin out. So it's, it's more of a push-your-luck game. I'm like, I, I was pretty cool. I liked it. It was neat. Um, the big thing, though, like Sean said, with two players, it was kind of eh. Like, like I got to see the game. Yeah. Now I want to try it with more. Like I, I want to play this with four or six players. Plus, again, the physicality. It's dice. I want to roll them. This is one I'd love to try in person. So see, again, once things clear up, if anyone Windsor's got this game, I'll totally play this. And see, I prefer it digitally, so I don't have to worry about all the fiddly dice and bits. But yeah. again, that's just that's just me. I'm lazy. I like I like computers taking care of uh, the bits for me. And I gotta <laughs> and I gotta talk to Eric uh, when when we're getting close to the end of our next one. I'll give yeah, Eric a poke so that when we start it up, uh, we'll we'll get you in there. Um, it's just a solid game, and one of the really interesting things about it is the random uh, track layout. So mm -hmm. we actually got one of the hardest tracks yeah, rough. I've ever driven on for our little two-player training game. Uh, and I that don't was, think we got up the sixth gear. No, it was ever. it was it was crazy. Um, but again, it was it was it was helpful in that it could teach you that there are some pretty nasty turns in there that is going to oh, burn yeah. that are going to burn you. All right. At this point, after Rally Man, not that Rally Man was was difficult or anything, but just it's the it was I don't even know what time it was to be honest. It was early, and my brains were melting a bit. We decided to go for something lighter and quicker. Um, I booted up Hive. Uh, this is still one of my all time favorite two player games. We played a few rounds of that. Now that one, I think you had played with me in person before, probably years ago. Yeah, it was uh, a, the first. It was the first time I played digitally, but. Yeah, very many years ago, we played it on the table down in, the, in your basement. Yeah, uh, long ago enough, I needed a refresher. Yeah, it, it's solid. I I still like it. Like overall, Hive's a great game. It and BGA's version was pretty good. I it, just were, don't switch to the three D mode. You were highly amused by the fact that what the the bugs always turn towards the queens. Yes, <laughs> yes, I did like that. I forgot about that. Yeah, all the bugs, no matter where the B was, would all look at it. So it was really good for figuring out where the opponent's B was. I'm like, my tiles don't do that. So yes, you're right. I had totally forgotten about that. That was a nice job. So if if you want to play Hive, BGA does do a great job of Hive. Yeah, I think it worked really well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, for some reason we discovered this, and I somehow I don't think we've ever actually noticed the button for it. There is a go to three D mode button in BGA, uh, which apparently needs to have games specifically designed for it. Because every time we've clicked it so far, all it's done is taken the flat screen and turned it yeah. to be everything flat on a flat screen, but at a an isometric angle. Um, Maybe there are some games where they have implemented this. Uh, you know, some of the newer games. I wonder if Santorini or something has got a 3D version. Um, but so far, nothing we've tried it on has. I figure if anything it was going to work on, it would have been Hive. And it didn't so. work on Hive. 
So at this point, I, I know I wanted a break from BGA. I think you wanted one too. I just like, I, I can't stare and read words anymore. I don't know. And I suggested booting up Star Wars The Old Republic. Now, yes, I mean the old, now free-to-play MMORPG. Um, we actually have a semi-regular Thursday night game with Sean Hamilton and Sean from Hamilton, Indiana, uh, where we've been slowly playing through the individual class storylines. I play a trooper, Deanna's a Jedi counselor, Sean Hamilton's a Jedi guardian, and Sean is, of course, our friendly local scoundrel who makes sure we get paid for all of our cases. <laughs> someone's someone's got to demand the huts pay up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is a game I used to play. I used to actually have a lifetime subscription back in the day. We I paid for it for months, got a lifetime subscription, then it went free to play, and I got mad because I was wasting my lifetime subscription and instead got whatever a monthly stipend of cartel coins or something. Anyway, we got back to this. We were just looking for some way to kill times and be able to hang out more often. So uh, we started playing. And one of the things they added to the game since it was first released and when I used to play it is something called the Conquest System. And while playing this time around, um, I got further than I ever had in the past. And I got to this point where I'm at level 11 crafting and I kept needing items that you can only get through conquest. I'm like, that's it. One Thursday when we were one, one of the Sean's wasn't free, Deanna and I sat down and I brought up the, one of the star Wars Wikipedias and I'm like, all right, what the hell are our conquest points? How the heck do I get them? What do I do? And we figured out exactly how they work. And a, big part of what we end up doing on extra life is i taught sean all about conquest points and what to do and basically all conquest points are is you get this bonus currency for doing things in the game right and pretty much all the things in the game like the killing things crafting and so on now to that there are weekly events where you get you you want to do things on certain planets for to, to earn conquest points. And if you get the 50,000 conquest points before the end of the week, you get a bunch of stuff for doing it. So that's what it is. I showed Sean the different conquest points and we traveled all over the galaxy and we went to far too many planets and killed 75 things on each planet and made sure to harvest some nodes. And I don't know, there was a bunch of stuff we did to, to get Sean conquest points. And to be fair, this is also, uh, you need to be part of a group uh, an official group in the game for this. It's not something you don't get the conquest points on your own, correct? No, you do. You oh, still you do. do, but you won't get the group rewards. Right. So, so you can earn conquest points on your own. So, personal conquest points. If you get fifty thousand conquest points in a week, you get a small reward. If you're part of a guild, it's actually part of the invasion system where your guild's going to pick one of the three highlighted planets to choose to invade. And if you get conquest points on that planet, it goes to the guild's total. And then if the guild gets to, I don't remember what, 50 million or something, by the end of the week, you get a guild reward. So I it's, something it's only five, it's on five million to do it. It's the, the, the 50 million is if you actually want to try and actually invade and win. But yeah, that's, that has to do with the guild thing. So yeah, we, so we both, we were, I was in a guild and I got Sean in the guild and we went out and did it. So we did that. That took a while. It was fun enough. We just walked around and I got to say, it's nice having our, um, companions heal us for a change <laughs> I, I got to sit back and just shoot stuff which was yeah. fun so once we both hit the weekly conquest point we both hit our fifty thousand. we were looking for something else to do and we decided to check out their i, I would call it their thanksgiving event i don't know feast day or something i yeah. can't remember what it was called yeah, it's feast day feast day so yeah they're having some kind of star wars feast day which i guess is something new in 2020 this is a a brand new event they ended they added to the game this year and i'm not sure if it's going to replace um life fest or whatever it's called but the no there's still there's no way they're going to skip life day ever so i yeah. mean life day is a major part of the star wars um canon yes. now <laughs> a part some people want erased well yes, yes there is that but uh whether or not you you want to erase it it's there you yes. locked it in so what i was expecting was to go off do a couple of silly little quests do something you know quick some quick and easy runs to grab some something and be done what well, what we got was so much more than that. Wow. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was crazy. Uh, I mean, our first shock was our, our first quest actually turned into a mini game playing as a droid doing work. You weren't even playing as yourself. You ended up taking over uh, a droid doing working as a droid in the kitchen or in the server or serving for this feast. Um, and that was interesting. It was almost a game of tapper. Um, you know, yeah, a slightly more yeah, or, or burger time. Yep, yep. Something else reminds me of. Uh, yeah, yeah we in a slightly that. more graphically friendly way. Yes, 
though graphically frustrating at times too. Trying to figure out how to interact with things yes, was there not were some easy. Problems with it. It wasn't. Yeah, wasn't one hundred percent done. But yeah. after that, we ended up catching a quest linked up to this uh, this event, uh, and I think we both thought that we were going to go off to a you know fly off to a planet, do something, come back, have mm. a cute little story, and be done. It wasn't that at all. <laughs> no. Uh, no, it was like insane, right? Like there was the first quest that was just like find ingredients on Hoth, right? So yep. we went to Hoth and we went to an area I'd never seen before that was way too high a level for the two of us. It was world boss. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, we were yeah. at the world boss. Yeah. So we found the ice crystals they wanted from Hoth and we brought those back and then they wanted the whisker off the world boss. I'm like, oh, no, that's like 16 players coordinated. Get your guild to do it. So like, OK, yeah. we're not going to do that. But then there's these two huts. And you can start talking to these huts who are both trying to put on this festival. And then they just started sending us all over the guy dang galaxy. Like it was insane. Like, I don't know how many quests did we do? Uh, I like seem in the to 20s? recall about eight, eight different planets that yeah. we, that we've each visited in order to go on uh, through all of this. And I mean, oh, it, it and it crazy. was funny. And not only that, um, it wasn't a linear quest because we actually no. separated and while yep. we were going to the same places, we were doing different things in different yes. places on those yeah. on those uh, planets. So there's these two huts, right? And one wants one one's actually like um, um, uh, beneficial. That's not the word. They're uh, both doing good. They're things. both scumbags, but one of them's trying to be nice, yes. and one of them one, one trying, one's to, trying to be nice. The other one's not at all. One's just trying to make money, and the other one's trying to just get their name well known. And you pick one of the two, and it got funny because like you go to one planet. And Sean was there trying to kill rare monsters to bring back meat for the feast. Meanwhile, I was trying to find you know, recipes that had been lost in time that were famous recipes. Now we were on the same planets, but I had to go to different spots to find these. And in the end, we each did the different plot and finished it off. And what was funny is for the, like, I don't know, three to five hours worth of work or whatever it took us. All we got was a title. Like that was it. Like at the end, yeah, I got the title, the Magnemonious, because of my my hut. You got the I forget the Avarice or something yeah, from yeah. your hut. <laughs> um, like that was it. Yeah. And of course, like lots of bonus points. So like this is the other thing they do for all these festivals is the Abundant. That's right, Deanna got it right. So Sean can now be titled the Abundant, and I I'm the Magnemonious which actually I think I set that on. And then you earn all these festival points and there's a festival vendor where you can buy all kinds of stuff that actually doesn't help the game at all, but is mostly um, aesthetic, right? You can get new speeder bikes and you can get outfits and stuff. It was totally worth it because I have the best hat ever. So <laughs> if nothing else, I earned an awesome hat. Absolutely. So after a whole bunch of uh, Star Wars, Sean was feeling it. I was feeling it. We were near in the end. We're like, all right, what are we going to do for like 45 minutes? So we just got to make it 45 more minutes and we're done. And what I think is really ironic is I was just scrolling through the games on Board Game Arena going, this is the point in time where we need something silly. We need like, we need a party game, like something that, that just kind of re-energizes us. And I scrolled through and I noticed they had concept. And what I think is hilarious about this is I don't know, like at least four different extra life events I've been to now. We ended off the first morning with concept. That was the last game I played before I cracked after 24 hours only to return to the game store six hours later to help clean up. But like, like four times in a row. And sure enough, we finished off with concept and Sean had never played concept despite me mentioning it in almost innumerable times on the show for there was a big joke in 2018 with our podcast that every game recommendation episode we brought up concept and i think there's a good reason for that so this was your first time ever playing it what'd you think so the implementation of concept on bga is really solid so yeah. despite the fact that i've never actually played it and just knew the rough concept of the game we were off and running in no time. I mean, there was no learning curve here. You, we just started. No, playing. not really. I mean, it was, you know, we were off and running and having as great a time as you can after 24 hours <laughs> yeah. of consciousness. Now, I got to admit, it, it's not the best two player, but it worked. It strongly warned us. It's like, don't play this two player. I'm like, yeah, it worked. We just took turns. You, yeah. you give a clue. I try to guess. I give a clue. You try to guess. And we actually now, had, we had think... some people in the chat room even who were yep. uh, sort of, you know, joking along and having fun. They were taking the people who had gone to bed like reasonable people yep. who came on to see if we were still up. So, yeah. 
So yeah, we finished off with concept, and that would be all the games we played at Extra Life this year in 2020. Despite not being able to get together in person, I think that's a significant number of games. I think we did pretty good. That's a good mix. We got some heavy stuff. Some well, not too heavy. We never really got that heavy. Draws of the Lions, clans, probably about clans as heavy and as jaws. Clans, clans of Caledonia was a little heavier, but most mostly games. A mix of stuff online and digital, which I think was kind of cool. I, I thought it was pretty fun. Yep. Well. How about a look ahead now that we're uh, we're over that uh, annual Pepper. event? What do you have planned for the coming weeks besides Amazon sales? Yeah, that's just it, right? So as I mentioned in the announcements earlier today, this November has been nuts. Uh, a little, little ridiculous. It's much busier than usual. Like, like this is always our busiest time of the year, but not usually this early into the month. Like it doesn't usually start November 1st. Like this is nuts due to this. You know what? We're going to take a few weeks off from the podcast, a couple weeks off. Uh, we're going to stop the live content in order to focus on stuff that brings in the money that lets us actually do the show week after week. Uh, we may or may not stream some Gloomhaven. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how things are playing out, whether Deanna and I sit down. But as far as the podcast goes, as the show we're recording right now, we are going to take a couple weeks off. Coming back, December 2nd is going to be our next live show. Now, during that time, I do hope to get some reviews written. So watch the social medias, watch our socials, watch the blog. I'm still going to, I'm going to be writing up an Ask the Bellhop article about uh, trick-taking games is still in the works. I am going to try to get some reviews out there. So there's still going to be some content trickling out there. Um, But I'll be, hopefully when we get back, I'll be a little less stressed out and we'll have lots of games to talk about. Yeah. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutila. Thank you. Jeff Seuss. Missed you running DCC for Extra Life. Kator. We miss seeing you on the Gloomhaven streams. We need more people there and we miss the games. And just don't lock yourselves out next time. (laughs) Well, that was the double bell. Uh, That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. New York Toronto time and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to get your podcatchers and YouTube every Tuesday at 2 a.m. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game on. Game on.